Mushrooms are really, really cool. It's Steve, the wax cat wizard. He's taught me everything I know about fungi and he's going to teach us loads more today. Studying mushrooms has completely changed my understanding of ecological time. And working with Steve has completely changed the way that I look at the landscape that I work in. He's told me how they communicate, how they connect everything in the habitats that they live in. He even showed me one that smelled like sexy men. <laughs> <laughs> now he's taking me on a journey across this amazing Yorkshire landscape to discover more about these incredible organisms and the impact they have on our world. So we're on a rainy hillside at National Trust Hardcastle Crags in Calderdale. The weather is drizzly and grey and that is perfect for looking for grass and fungi, is that right? Yeah, it is. I mean, I've been doing my rain dance for the past few weeks, just praying for this rain. It's been so dry for so long. Everywhere through the country looks so arid, but then you come back to Calderdale and it's still green. Why is that? When we're thinking about fungi, we might be thinking about mushrooms, but actually the fungus is a big network of fibres underground, which is called mycelium. And if we were to take a handful of this soil, we could have 10 kilometres of these mycelial strands and each one of these is carrying water and nutrients and they're in a relationship with the grasses and the plants so they can tap into those kind of deeper reserves of water and bring that up to the plants and water the grass and then the grass stays green right through those dry periods. I spotted something teeny tiny and weird looking in the grass. Actually this is something really interesting. Oh it's really freaky looking. It is. This is actually a parasite. Oh. So you may be familiar with the recent TV series, The Last of Us. So in The Last of Us, they've got these human parasitizing fungi and they're based on this. Oh. <laughs> but fortunately, okay. this does not parasitize humans. In the ground, we've got ground living moth larvae, caterpillars, basically. And they're just living underneath the grass nibbling away on their roots. But then, as they're nibbling away, they ingest some of these spores. And once the spores get into the body... I don't like where this is going. <laughs> then they start to develop. <laughs> and so they're using the caterpillar as food and they're converting that into their own mycelium and fill the caterpillar's body with mycelium. Oh, wow. So after a little while, it's very, very dead. And then this lovely mushroom pops out of their head. Oh my word. Releases more spores and the circle continues. That is very cool and very gruesome. I love it. And actually there's a, there's a related species, looks the same, grows on the Tibetan plateaus that's worth more than its weight in gold oh, wow. for its medicinal properties. Oh. Now I have to say that I've eaten quite a few of these. Uh, in the hope that I will have these magical medicinal properties and not a lot Anything happened. not has happened. No, so uh, yeah, it I've given look, up on that now. It doesn't look particularly appetizing. It, it doesn't, no. Well, they go well in the stir fry. <laughs> but I think we've probably got other cool things that we can go and hunt out. Nice. So, let's, let's get hunt. going. I think most people, when they think about fungi, probably think of woodland habitats. So what are we doing out here, Steve? We're really interested in ancient grasslands. And ancient grasslands are identifiable by their complexity. And that complexity can be plants, but it can also be the fungi. And in fact, the fungi are probably the best measure because they take such a long time to develop their complexity. But the most well-known and kind of the most exciting and most interesting, the most colorful are the hygros ibis, the wax caps. And this field's got loads of different species of wax caps. And in fact, we've got a really nice one just here. So this one looks like a scarlet wax cap. I mean, just check out this colour. It is striking, isn't it? It is. It's amazing. It's yeah. so beautiful. They're like little rubies in the grass. They are. I was going to say they're like jewels in yeah. the grass. Yeah. yeah. So just have a little feel of that cap. Ooh. So Waxy. Is it okay to pick them? Well, yes. So once this has come up and it's opened its gills, it's released loads of spores. So, it, you know, it's kind of job's done. And actually, if I was to leave this on the ground when we left, it will carry on releasing those spores. Is there any that we need to be a bit careful of or any of them poisonous? In these grassland fungi, to the best of my knowledge, none of them are toxic. Um, some of them, if you were to eat them, might not be good to eat. Maybe you might get a bit of a stomach ache or something like that, but none of them are poisonous. So we just have to use some kind of common sense, you know, 
before we have our lunch, we'll, we'll wash our hands. So these are really beautiful, but are they kind of performing any function in this habitat? There are some things that we know, and there's a whole lot of stuff that we've still got to find out. But what we do know is that they're in relationships with, with plants. This one, there was a really interesting experiment, which was to do with blank called ribwort plantain. And uh, when they did some DNA work on the ribwort plantain, they found the DNA of scarlet waxcap in there. So they're like, okay, so, so there's a relationship between these two. So what they tried to do then was to take seed of ribwort plantain and use various cleaning methods to make sure that they were completely sterile. And then they planted them out with the spores of the variety of different waxcaps and then they took them and they did a DNA test on them. And so the ones that they'd put with the scarlet wax cap had snowy wax cap in. So they were like, hang about, we didn't use any snowy wax cap in our experiments, we didn't have any snowy wax cap spores. Where's this snowy wax cap come from? And what has been figured out from that is that the, the maternal plant incorporates the fungus into the seed. What? <laughs> so when that seed germinates, it's already got its symbiote Whoa. living within it. That's amazing. And so then the question is, why? What you know? What are they doing? And and that's something that we that we don't know. But when something's incorporated in that way, it's not just entering whilst it's alive. It's actually there from birth. And one of the things that it can do is gene switching. So a fungus could switch a gene within inside a plant, which would increase the thickness of the cell walls. So if you're in a drought situation um, and you're transpiring and you've got moisture moving through the cell walls, if the cell walls are thicker, you can hold more water. So the fungus is carrying out lots of different functions inside plants, many of which we don't know yet, but helping those plants to better adapt to these conditions. Amazing. Oh, look at these. These these are exciting. Oh, are they? They're not as, as beautiful and exciting as the no, waxcaps. No, they're not, but... but they've got other things that's uh, exciting about them. This is a pink gill. They can be very difficult to identify. There's a lot of them that are very samey, but there's also quite a range of different shapes and sizes and colours. A really good feature of this one is the smell. So oh. I want you to just have a little smell of this. Yeah, it's like wet, manky cupboard. Ooh. It's called mealy. It's the smell of wet flour. It is the smell of wet flour, yeah. That, that's yeah, it, yeah, so yeah. that's your wet cupboard. This one has been assessed as being vulnerable to extinction. Wow, right. You'll have heard of red listed species, but here we're talking about the global red list. So this is equivalent to the snow leopard. Wow. Or the giant panda. Or the blue whale. So they're globally threatened. What are the drivers behind that? One of the major reasons has been changes in agriculture since what was called the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution, as we might understand it now, might all be about nature restoration and everything. But originally, the Green Revolution was about growing more crops, you know, feeding more animals. And so that's the introduction of fertilizers. It feels fertilized. All of these species have gone. We can produce more food, and that's a good thing. But from a conservation perspective, it's bad. Can we not just then revert it to kind of rewild the field and revert it to nature? Will that not restore these species? So let's say we were to take a field that had been fertilized and it's been reseeded with ryegrass and leave it fallow and then see how long does it take before this species reappears? Well, for any one of these species, that could be as quick as 50 years. Wow, right. But then another species will take advantage of a niche that's been created and it will start to appear and then another and another and another. But for us to get to this complexity that we've got here is literally going to take 500 years, a thousand years, wow. you know, a really long time. And we like things to happen fast as humans, don't we? We know. We're just like, we want a field full of cool mushrooms. Well, if we want that, the best way to do that is don't damage the field that's full of mushrooms because that's the only ones you're going to get. So how important is cold avail for fungi? Like how many species are there here? That's a big question. There are so many species of fungi in the world. There are so many that we've not yet recorded. But just in the work that I've been doing, we've recorded over 200 species wow. in this area. And that's a lot. I've discovered 
three species which are new to science. One of those is a new genus. So there's going to be loads and loads of things out there that we've not even given a name to yet. So Colderville's really special in that respect. So mushrooms are very cool. They're very pretty. There's some funky ones, but why are they important? What has, what has fungi ever done for us? Fungi do loads of stuff and they're really underappreciated, I think. They're recyclers, you know, that's so important. So in a woodland, for example, the tree falls down. It's the fungi that are breaking that tree down and turning it into soil and releasing all of those nutrients, which can then be used by the other plants that are there. But actually, the fungi are really the engineers of ecosystems, and they're working with plants to sequester carbon. So when a plant's photosynthesizing, it's producing loads of sugars. Up to 70% of those sugars could be traded with a fungus, and those sugars are then going into the mycelium, down into the ground. Now, some of those individuals that we've been looking at today could live for a thousand years. Wow. Exactly, it's like a massive amount of time. And that's, that's why working with this fungi, you just kind of, it blows your mind on these time scales. And so for that thousand years, that fungus is holding onto all of that carbon that it's traded with the plants and that's going down into the soil. So it sounds like fungi are kind of the invisible thread in the landscape that are just holding everything together totally doing that in this landscape and in all landscapes. Fungi are in the soil, they're in the air, they're in our bodies and they're performing loads and loads of functions. If we didn't have fungi, the whole thing would go <laughs> If you want to be a bit more like a fungus and build some connections of your own, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and share with a friend. See you next time.